Hello and welcome to the second part of the lecture, lecture series on Richard de Sousa's Apocalypse Soon. In the first part, I mainly go through the background or context to the poem. And if you haven't listened to this, or if you are interested in listening, listening to that part before you listen to this lecture, you can access the link that I have provided over here to that video. Now, coming back to this particular video, here I will be going through a line by line and at times a stanza by stanza analysis of the first four stanzas of the poem. Uh, and I will be covering the rest of the stanzas in part three, which is also the final part of this lecture series, which I will be uploading in a week or two. And in this video, we, we will be approaching the study of the poem by first reading the stanza or stanzas, and then going to the analysis of it instead of reading the entire poem at a stretch. So without taking too much time, let's now go to the first slide and also the first stanza. So I'll start by reading it first. The child plays in the fire, scattering sparks when suddenly the street erupts in waves of flaming hate and splintered flying glass, shattering old amities and sharding bonds forged, so we thought, proof against hate. So the poem, as we see, starts with a very stereotypically innocent image of a child playing. However, the child is playing in the fire, which indicates a sense of danger lurking. Also, there is this deliberate contrasting effect that we can notice here. And we can perhaps analyze this as an example of the literary technique called juxtaposition. So what is juxtaposition? Juxtaposition is the act of placing two or more things side by side parallelly to create a very interesting effect. And this can be done by comparison or even contrasts. Basically, the poet is making an impact by starting this poem with a very deceptively innocent image of a child playing, by juxtap but juxtaposes it in the very same line by saying that the child is playing with fire. So this clearly disturbs the reader because it immediately indicates a threat to a particularly vulnerable being like that of a child. Then the poem continues on the same line of thought and builds upon the tension and suspense when the poet says the child plays in the fire scattering sparks, which, as you know, is the vein in which the fire comes alive. This is also something we should notice in the poem that De Soisa is continues to do so as the poem progresses on. That is the way in which De Soisa builds the tension and suspense with the escalating violence and tragedy of the events which take place. Also, like I mentioned in the first part of this lecture series, it is important to recall that since this poem was written in August 1981, these events which happen in 1983 are yet to take place. And in the next line, the immediacy of the danger is imminent because the streets erupt in waves of flowing hate and splintered flying glass. So these lines inspire very rich, powerful and evocative visual images of the fire erupting in waves of enmity, rage, violence and hatred, which spark the ethnic conflict between the Sinhalese and the Tamils. Such visual images clearly illustrate that these flames of violence and hatred are so overwhelming and are so overbearing, just like the uncontrollable nature of fire itself. Here we come, a, we, we are again reminded or we recall as to why this poem comes across as a prophetic account, because, the, because as the reader, we know that despite being written in August 1981, the poem comes across as a revelation of the horrors the Tamils were subjected to as a result of the drastic turn of the ethnic violence uh, back in July 1983. And in the next few lines of the stanza, the source says that these waves of enmity shatters old amities and sharding bonds forged, so we thought, proof against heat, which evokes the sentiments or emotions of that of the ethnic conflict of the nation, which destroys the relationships and friendships between diverse ethnicities, including the already fragmented ones, the fragmented ties 
between these groups. These bonds are unable to withstand the potency of these flames and thus collapse. Let's now go to the next slide. I'll start by reading the next stanza. After sharp showers, the street boys play mud, when suddenly a flood of enmity thicker than blood descends, and to the singing of the lead, khaki and gunmetal and iron treat, advance and take their vantage at the corner. Here de Soisa continues to engage in an interplay of innocent and degenerated visual images in the first and second lines. This is evident because he starts by describing an innocent image of the boys playing in the street and mud, and then suddenly shifts to the unforeseen and degenerated image of the flood of enmity, which is thicker than blood. We further see that he intertwines natural forces with that of human nature, actions and interventions. And this seems to be clearly something he engages in in the first tense of the poem. So if you recall the first tense, you know that he's talking about the spread of fire. And the spread of fire is a natural phenomenon, but it is controlled by human intervention to spread the violence and enmity between ethnic communities, such as the Sinhalese and Tamils. And in this particular stanza, we see the Soisa is actually continuing in the same line of thought because another natural phenomenon, which is a flood, is connected by the Soisa to the human emotions and actions to describe or to uh, convey the devastating hatred, which is thicker than blood that descends upon the nation. Apart from that, it is important to identify the use of blood here by the poet, because that is uh, blood is usually something in literature, which can act as a very powerful visual image to convey an evil horror. And that is clearly what the Soisa is uh, doing as well, because he's using blood to evoke the horror and terror of the ethnic violence. And from there onwards, we see the poet critiquing the government of Sri Lanka and the institutions of power when he describes the khaki and gunmetal and iron who treat and advance. This is a reference to the khaki uniforms and weapons of gunmetal and iron of authorities such as the police, such as the army officers. But we can also say that it can be an extended reference to the deliberate inaction and indifference on the part of law enforcement authorities to crack down on the violence. He says that it, they take their vantage at the corner, which means that they monitor from a corner without taking action. So this only reinforces the indifference on the part of the government and the law enforcement authorities who do not abide by the law to help the people and quell the anti-Tamil riots. And from there, let's move on to the next few stanzas. So I'll start by reading the third and fourth stanzas before going to the analysis. Hot August night with pulsating stars burning like sores above. Love is a sweat and intercourse in shadows will beget. Lust only for the frenzies of a rape of sluttish cul-de-sacs and bottlenecks. The bottlenecks are broken, jagged and spears the vitals of nation. Death words are spoken, old familiars fall silent and retreat to roots. The junction stations soon will fit, will fill the seat in hordes like ants before the rain. Fear breathing herds and hard ridden to the kill, and on the concrete platforms, platforms hop nailed boots drown the thunder of the rain. So we start the poem with the line "Hot August night." which reminds us again about the context to this poem, because it was written in August 1981 as the poet's response to the ethnic violence which took place in Sri Lanka. So to give you a better understanding, I'm going to share a report with you. Uh, bear with me while I share this with you. So I will also be providing you with a link to this report, and it will be in the page of uh, references that I have provided in uh, this particular video. Okay, so now that you can see 
this uh, report, we can see that, okay, so before that, I should tell you where I have taken this from. So this report is taken from, uh, it is, uh, the name of the report is Black July 1983, 40 years on, and it is published by the Sri Lanka Campaign for Peace and Justice in July 2023. So this gives us an idea of the timeline of events which culminate to the tragedy that took place in July 1983. So we can see that we are starting with the independence in, uh, in 1948, and then we go to the Sinhala Only Act in 1956, which established Sinhala as the only official language in Sri Lanka, marginalizing the Tamils and other ethnicities of the nation. And then uh, it identifies, it continues to map out the riots which took place over the years until we go to, so I will be skipping these events, but they're all very important. You can read them by yourselves later on when you access this report. So we go to 1981 here because that is what gives us the backdrop to this poem. So the events, um, there can be a series of events which prompt this Zoysa to write this poem. And these, these events can be the historic burning of the Jaffna Library um, back in 1981 uh, by a Sinhalese mob uh, who destroyed over 97,000 books and scrolls. And this wasn't an act which was stopped by either the law enforcement authorities such as the police and uh, not even the government ministers who were at Jaffna at the time put a stop to it which is extremely problematic and another series of events which could have motivated this soy star to voice his criticism were the organized anti-Tamil riots by the Sinhalese mobs who looted and burned houses and shops owned by the Tamils which sweep across mm. several areas of the nation so from this context, now let's go back to the poem. Okay, so I think you can see the stanza now in the slides. So when we go back to the poem and after understanding more about the context to this poem, it is clearly evident that the Soisa chronicles the arson, looting and violence which took place from June to August in the poem. Further, we can say that he's also referring to these activities which occurred after J.R. Jayaratana declared an island-wide emergency on August 17th, 1981. So this is perhaps the reason why he describes the hot August night with pulsating stars burning like source above where he again intertwines nature along with human actions and interventions. And this is evident when he expresses that the stars in Yoga's night burn like souls as in raw and painful ways, which connects the agony and suffering of the people to that of nature or natural forces or natural phenomena. And in the next few lines, such as the lust only for the frenzies of a rape of sluttish cul de sacs and bottlenecks. We see how he describes the series of violent attacks, which even goes to the extent of sexual abuse on the Tamils during this night, before and especially uh, does it did occur in 1983, which was after less than, I believe, two years upon the writing of this poem. And um, then we go to the next stanza, which starts with this repeated word of bottlenecks. So that is important because we see that the bottlenecks, that was the way, that was the final word of the previous tensa, And now we are starting with that word in the next tensa as well. So what are bottlenecks? So in the context of this particular poem, bottlenecks can be a literal reference to the word, an object which is used for the purpose of violence and perpetuating violence. He says that jagged ends of the bottlenecks pierce the vitals of a nation, which can be a very powerful visual image to, to describe how the nation is metaphorically pierced and destroyed by the literal violence and suffering of its people. And the line 
uh, and this line, of course, and also the next few lines also, continue to resonate the impact of ethnic violence, which affects the literal and metaphoric shaping of a nation. And moreover, we see that he is also using animalistic images to reinforce and superimpose the violence that take place, such as seeping hordes like ants before the rain, which conveys the vulnerability of the victims. That is the Tamils who are unable to safeguard themselves from the mobs and fear breathing herds hard ridden to the kill, which can perhaps denote uh, the perpetrators of violence. And in this case, that is the scene for these mobs. But we should also notice something important here as well. That is that the poet or the or the Soisa does not explicitly name these ethnicities here, right? So perhaps that can be a way for us to think that this poem has a generalizing effect because we can generalize this experience and even say that no matter the community, no matter the geography or temporal limitations, violence breeds suffering, agony and pain. And that is indeed universal. And then the next, uh, the stanza ends, as we can see, by saying uh, uh, the sound. It's talking about the sound of boots which drown out the thunder of the rain. So this can maybe, I'm not very sure about this, but I assume that this can perhaps be a reference to the boots worn by the law enforcement authorities, such as the police force to again express their inactivity and indifference, their passive, uh, their passive uh, outlook to the violence which was taking place. From there, we go on to... So as you can see um, here, I have provided you with a page of references. And the report that I mentioned, which I have taken the timeline form, timeline from, is given over here under this link. You can click it and read the entire thing if you like. That will give you a lot of background information um, into the ethnic conflict of uh, Sri Lanka. So with that, we come to the end of the part two video on Richard Isoisa's Apocalypse Zone. So we will resume uh, with the rest of the video, the rest of the stanzas in the next part, which is part three. And that is also the final part of this lecture series. So thank you so much for listening from the beginning to the end. Please subscribe for more content.